Well, welcome to the Business Spotlight Series. My name is Tanner O'Brien. I'm a senior partner here at Action Coach in Central Texas. Today, I'm sitting down with Carolyn Jenkins, who is the CEO and co-founder of We Are Here. Excited to be sitting down. Carolyn, thank you for taking the time. It is a pleasure to have you kind of on the Spotlight Series here to have you know, some conversation, talk about you know business and entrepreneurship and all this crazy thing that uh, you know many of us are on here. Um, so thank you. And you know, let's just start with a little bit of background. Share kind of maybe the 10,000 foot view of kind of who you are, what your background is, and then tell us a little bit about We Are Here. Well, first, thank you so much for the invitation to speak with you and share with your audience. I really appreciate it. Uh, I, what about me? My background. My background has been, I will tell you, it's been about see a need, fill a need. Um, because it's not been very well planned. <laughs> Meaning, I I don't want to go too far back, but my um, my undergraduate degree was in journalism, but I never became a journalist. I went and got a master's in business with a focus in marketing communication, but I've never led the marketing team other than as a CEO. You know, I've been responsible for marketing. Uh, what I have done is co-found a bunch of startups that have gone on to um, have exits, and those in those opportunities, I got to wear a lot of different hats. So I've been head of human resources. I've been head of customer success. I've been head of a H and you know, a human resource consulting practice <laughs> and just had a lot of variety of experience because every time it's like, oh, something needs to be done. And I'm like, well, I can do that. And then I just start doing it because that's what happens in small companies, right? All your listeners who are in the small company world know you wear lots of hats. And so you just, I start fixing things that can be fixed. And so I've had this very crazy, fun career where I've got to wear a lot of different hats and have a lot of different experiences. I love that. So tell us about, uh, we are here. Tell us about kind of where we're at today and, and what this what this business looks like. Well, thank you. So in, in 2018, I was very excited to be hired by uh, a gentleman here in town in Austin, Joel Trammell, to be CEO of one of his software companies. I did not co-found that company. But it made me feel like, wow, like I've, I've gotten there in my career. And 60 days later, I was told I had cancer. Uh, so it became a, a journey. Um, and I was handed by one of the leading oncology teams, you know, in Central Texas, a two-inch binder that was not real helpful. Um, and as of someone who's done technology companies over and over again, it just was so obvious to me, technology could have made this experience better. Um, for the whole multiple year journey, it was like, wow, like there's so many problems to solve here. So that story is important because we are here is addressing three major gaps in cancer care. Uh, my co-founders are also cancer survivors like myself um, or have been cancer caregivers, which I have also am a two-time cancer caregiver. And in all those roles, you realize the mayhem and that we have the opportunity to make this better. And by making it better, we can make this a better patient experience, but we can also make it better for the clinical staff who tries to help the patients. But we can also make it better for employers who have um, employees who are going through cancer and cancer caregiving, meaning literally it's financially better for the employer to use our solution. But we can also lower the cost of care and improve outcomes. So it's better for payers, providers, clinicians, patients, caregivers, family members. Um, we are really excited about the solution we've pulled together. I love it. So you mentioned kind of covering the three major gaps in in, in this process. Um, what are those, those gaps that are being covered? So today, the standard operating procedure when you're told you have cancer is um, you panic and you start Googling because you don't have access to your oncology team until your first appointment. Mm -hmm. And that might be days, but depending on your socioeconomic status, your demographics, your geographics, that also might be weeks or months. For example, in Tyler, Texas, from the day you're told you have cancer until your first appointment is three weeks. In the state of Louisiana, there's a certain population where it's three months. So now you really are doom squirreling and you're trying to find out and you're panicking, how am I going to pay for it? What am I going to do? You can't start treatment until you can afford to start treatment. So that's the first gap. Access to help with how are you going to handle this financially, mentally? What does it mean for your family, your pets, your kid? I mean, because cancer 
blows up every single aspect of your life. Matter of fact, 80% of your outcome is not related to the actual medical treatment, but it's related to all these other factors that influence your ability to get access to that amazing medical treatment. So that's the first gap that we address because our platform is available day one and 24 seven. The second gap is that there is so much information to help you with the non-medical, because we're focused on non-medical, that 80%, um, that no one can figure it all out. I got a two inch binder and it was still missing a lot of stuff. There are 5,400 cancer nonprofits in this country. There's over 90,000 cancer products on Amazon alone. And there are dozens of community resources, dozens of community government agencies, Nobody has time to go find the ones that are the right fit, but our platform does that. So if you're like, if you think about when you go to your oncology team, your nurse navigator, they're focused on your medical care because, well, that's what they're supposed to do. That's their job. But you want them to help you figure out how are you going to pay for it or how are you going to get gas or who's going to watch your kids or what do you tell your kids or they're just so many things. And so, again, we aggregate all of the information rather than making you go find it on your own. So that's the second gap. The third gap is when you finally get out of active treatment, you don't even have access to the nurse navigator or social worker anymore, but your life doesn't magically go back to normal just because you've left active treatment. Most cancer pa patients end up with some form of comorbidity. I left with two. Um, and for people who aren't familiar with that word, um, my cancer treatment, because we removed lymph nodes, I did end up with mild lymphedema in my left arm, but we caught it early. So that was good for me. Um, but I also um, ended up being thrown into menopause because I chose, because of the cancer I had and a gene I had to also remove my ovaries proactively. So you leave cancer and you're like, yeah, I'm cancer free, but now I have all this new stuff and your finances aren't normal. Your relationships are normal, but we keep helping people even when they're not in active treatment. Hmm. I love it. I love the clarity of all three of those and being able to make it, you know, very easy to understand for, for those of us in the audience. I appreciate you kind of going through those. Um, now I want to take a step back and kind of mention something else or talk about something else that you mentioned at the beginning of this, before we kind of get into the business side of things. Um, you mentioned having the opportunity to wear a bunch of different hats in, in business overall. Um, I absolutely love that. Cause one of my favorite questions to ask is like in the business that you're in today, what hat or series of hats do you wear today <laughs> that uh, that you get to kind of have and in transition between um, so that'll be kind of question number one uh, we'll start there with like what is, what is your role in the business today kind of what hats do you wear uh, and then do you want to move it into this next piece it's you know of all the different hats that you've gotten to wear in your journey which are your favorite and which are your least favorite oh those are very good questions all right so today i mean we are a startup um, and I do have a team. I'm not a solopreneur, um, but I wear, gosh, almost every hat. Um, it's almost easier to tell you what hat I don't wear. You know, like <laughs> I have a controller because while I can read the financials, I really don't want to be the person like figuring the financials out. Um, I don't do our patient navigation. We, I mean, we navigate patients, their family members, caregivers, survivors, pre -vivers. And one of my co-founders is a certified coach. So I only navigate if she's on vacation. Otherwise, you know, she does that. So I'm not in the weeds every single day helping other individuals. Um, I am driving the business strategy. I'm driving the fundraising process. I do get in there and code some <laughs> a little, but we do have someone like my coding skills are really rusty and old. Uh, but I do a lot of configuration with our tools. Like I am very hands-on in doing those things, you know, um, and I enjoy that. And I do a lot of testing. Um, I might be our um, biggest tester every time we roll out new functionality. I'm in there, you know, testing it, even though other people also test it. I like to be hands-on and see how it's working. Um, you know, chief, I am chief problem solver and chief bottle washer. <laughs> and I'm both. <laughs> like, <laughs> thank you. I love it. Um, so in your journey, which uh, which hats have you found to be kind of the ones that you love the most and which ones are are your least favorite uh, that 
when you have them, those are the first ones to to hand off to somebody else as quickly as possible. Uh, um, I love the aspect of the roles. Like when I was head of human resources, I had a customer success. I love the aspects of the roles where you're interacting with people and it is your job to lift them up and help them succeed, right? It's my job to help the customer succeed. It's my job to help the customer look good to their boss, or it's my job to help the employees succeed. Um, understanding their personalities and working with each one in the way they need to be worked with. I love all that. I hate administrivia. Like I hate doing payroll. I hate like the things that are um, routine. I mean, that's my personality. And thank God there are people in the world who love routine. And then together we all make the world go around because I don't like doing the same thing over and over again. Um, I like the change and the challenge. I love it. That, that, that It's always fun to kind of hear um, when you can kind of connect different personalities with different roles that they enjoy, don't enjoy, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, everything is important. That's why we all have different skill sets and it's fantastic. Exactly. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the business, uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of navigate through this here. Um, but I, you know, I heard you mention that there's, there's a couple different ways that your platform can, can help others from employers, um, it being, you know, less expensive on healthcare costs and things like that, and can help, you know, navigate for their employees. Obviously it's important for the actual patients themselves and the families of patients. Um, so kind of knowing some of that, I'm going to ask the generalized question of, you know, who primarily does your business serve? Like if I was in the audience and, um, and I'm, and I'm listening to this and I'm understanding it, how would I know that I'm a good fit or I might know somebody that's a good fit, um, or could make a referral over to, to you and your business for, for the platform? Yeah. Well, thank you for, um, asking that. I'm, I'm going to assume most of the people are business owners and, and use that focus. I will say longer term, like we have to go through some steps. We want insurance company to cover this in the future, but that is a multi-year process to make that happen. So that's where we're headed because we want everyone who has cancer to be able to have the service that we provide. And the best way to do that is have insurance companies pay for it. That's no easy feat though. Meanwhile, let's talk about as an employer, um, you can break the employers into two buckets. Employers who are self-insured and employers who are not self-insured. And let's just start on not self-insured, just based on the conversation you and I had about who probably the listeners are, like what size business they have. Yep. I'm going to assume most of them insured are not self-insured. They're insured through you know, a corporate carrier. Let's, as an employee benefit, there is a study out there by John Hopkins. There is a $139 billion a year in lost work productivity related to cancer and cancer caregiving. Because if you have are the person with cancer, and a lot of them who have jobs try and keep their jobs, um, you're scrolling, you're, you're looking, right? It's that there's no centralized resource. So you're spending time at work trying to coordinate things. And so your work productivity goes down. Um, matter of fact, most the studies say most people say it goes down to 86%. And if you are the cancer caregiver, you're doing the same thing. How do I help this person? I need to coordinate these things. So just in the amount of time we're able to reduce lost work productivity, it more than pays for the cost of the solution. Um, we on average save people 70 hours of time that they don't have to spend looking for the right resources. And I want to put in perspective, especially for the employers, because employers, if they if they haven't been through cancer, sometimes if you haven't walked the shoes, you don't see where the gaps are. And you're like, well, they have health insurance. Why do they need a nonprofit? I was on health insurance. Um, I was on a high deductible health plan. Now, I did not go to high pro um, um, a nonprofit, but I did have to write a $3,000 check just to start treatment because I had to meet my deductible. And then you had to write checks. I'm on a high deductible health plan. My maximum out of pocket was $6,000 back then. That was, you know, many years ago. Um, I had to write a lot of checks. And so a lot of people have jobs and they have insurance, but they still can't afford the treatment. It's so expensive. 
the majority of bankruptcies in this country are related to cancer. Hmm. So as an employer, if you have an employee who has cancer or they are the caregiver or spouse of someone with cancer, our solution is beneficial. Not Yes, as a morale booster and as a care for your employee option, but it also will help your bottom line because of the reduction in work productivity. Employers have a second option to improve the cost of care. And you're not gonna see that year one. Um, but if you are an employer who has employees, let's say who, again, corporate insurance, not self-insured, um, but you have you like longevity with your employees. You know, some employers have a lot of churn, but if mm -hmm. we will reduce the cost of care, which will help your future renewals because the cost of care for the cancer was lower. Mm. So, and now if you're self-insured, in case you have any self-insured, we can reduce cost of care $4,500 a year, year one. So for the people that are self-insured. That's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Um, so how do you get the word out about all of this? You know, I did this kind of transitions to marketing. I love asking a couple questions around marketing. It's important for every business out there, but doesn't mean that we're all fantastic at it from day one. Um, so I like to just ask some questions on, you know, what has been your experience? What do you see? What's your philosophy? What are lessons learned or, or best practices? But, um, especially for, for your platform, how do you get the word out there? Uh, what, what, what have you found so far being the most effective ways to, to market for, for the business? Um, our most effective approach so far, well, let me back up and say, um, there, there's something to understand because as a startup, we started direct to consumer, but not charging. We were direct to consumer because we needed to actually help people and we wanted to source our data ethically um, and have proprietary data and their permission to use it to build the AI. So we had to go direct to consumer to have the ability to get all that data. Um, so if you go look today, I mean, we look very direct to consumer. That's not our go-to-market. That was our get our data plan. And now we're just now sort of pivoting that we've released the AI and we're pivoting to going to employers, providers, health plans. But we will always be here to help individuals and they can go ask employers for help, right? Paying for stuff. But our best, then now back to my long-winded answer. The social media posts that we do, and we don't do paid media, but the social media posts that are, call it a little more raw, um, those things resonate within the cancer community and they get reposted. And then people who need help find us and they come to us because they've seen messages that... Um, I mean, even if it's just as raw as something that's like, you know, cancer's not over when you ring the bell. Um, what doesn't resonate as much as the typical um, marketing around cancer where you see someone who doesn't have any hair or what, like literally we can have no image and just a beautiful background with a cutout that has impactful words on it, you know, um, cancer ruined my intimacy that will resonate because people are like yes and nobody talks about that right i finished cancer and yet i'm still messed up nobody talks about that those are the things that resonate and get us people come in and sign up i love that do you see the the philosophy changing much as you shift more towards the you know moving towards employers and providers and and kind of more the the entities uh, out there that you'd be selling to longer term um do you see that you know approach with kind of the raw post things like that for people for humans uh, to kind of see that and that that be the lead in to to being able to have these conversations with say employers or does it take a different approach from a marketing standpoint um even if you're not there yet just kind of curious on on your thoughts around it it's absolutely a different message because the message to a business has to focus on how it financially helps the business. Um, and I'm not cynical to mean em employers obviously want to care for their employees. They can't afford to do absolutely everything out there. They would go out of business. 
right? There's a lot of different, and I don't mean just cancer, right? It's like, oh, well, what if we do something for our, our employees with diabetes or our employees with cancer or, our, you know, you just can't afford to do it all. So business owners all have to make choices. So we have to speak to them about how this helps them financially while also this amazing benefit for the employee. Like it really is a win-win. And so our marketing does have to shift to start talking about the financial impact to the customer, be that the business or in the future, the payer that we want to pay for this. Um, you know, you have to speak to people's bottom lines and hope they also hear the emotional message along the way for the difference it will make for their employees. Fantastic. Uh, before we jump into kind of some rapid fire questions, I do want to be respectful of our time. I, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask the question around where do you see the business in the next three to five years? You know, kind of quasi short term, but thinking a little bit further out. Um, what's the what's the vision for the the next handful of years? Um, well, thank you again the, that study. So we in order to have an insurance company, again, because it needs to be a financial incentive. We have to go through a study to show that we do lower the cost of care and we do improve outcomes. Um, part of it seems really logical. We're getting people into treatment sooner. We're getting them into to stay in treatment. All that is, you know, of course, we're going to improve outcomes. But there was a three-year study. There is um, evidential study that what we're doing will absolutely also reduce cost of care and improve outcomes. But we have to do our own study. So long-term Three years from now, that's about the time we'll be signing up lots of payers. Uh, we will have finished the study with our first payer and we will be signing up payers. So that's where we'll be. But five years from now, when someone has cancer, I literally want, we are here to be the first thing they think. Not, I need to go doom scroll on Google. I want us to be like, oh, instead of Amazon, it's like, we are here. Like people know that's where you go to get the help that you need. Beautiful. Uh, so as we begin to wrap up, I've got a few rapid fire questions for you. Just kind of pull out some additional nuggets of wisdom. We can kind of draw back on your entire, you know, entrepreneurial business experience for for a lot of these. Uh, but four of them in total. First one, when you look at your journey so far, what would you say for you is has been your key to success? Positive attitude. I like that. How about a piece of advice that you give to other entrepreneurs or business owners? Um, stop using the golden rule and start using the platinum rule. I like that one. For those that don't know the platinum rule, what is the platinum rule? Platinum rule is to treat others the way they want to be treated. It's that recognition that we all have different motivators, different personalities, different things. Um, and if you meet people where they are, you're more likely to get the results you want. I love that. Uh, book recommendation, either a book that you've read most recently or are currently reading, um, or if you've got another book that just kind of comes to mind, that would be a good recommendation for the audience. What would be a book recommendation? All right. Well, I am currently reading 20 million tons under the sea by Real, Rear Admiral Daniel Gallery. <laughs> it's a fascinating read. I'm only about 25% of the way done, but the book is about the capture of the German U-boat 505 that's on display at the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry. And what I love about the book, and you can apply this to business is in life in general, but in the Ford, he talks about how the capture was really a series of, he made mistakes. And, but the German skipper also made mistakes and it was sort of right time. He was in the right place at the right time, but he knew how to leverage that situation rather than letting the mistakes get him down. And that's kind of how life is. You make mistakes, pivot, learn from it. You've got to be at the right place at the right time. And you have to recognize that and leverage it. And so I think it's, even though it's not officially the business book, there's a heck of a lot of business lessons in this book. That's fantastic. And for the record, I love getting recommendations that are not straight business books. We get a lot of those. So it's nice to have kind of some other things to add on to the reading list. And that's fantastic. I'm putting that one on my list here. Um, all right. Final rapid fire question. Then we'll kind of wrap up with uh, with my ending question for the day. But um, this one's just kind of fun. When you look at the business today and you could choose just one area and you only get to choose one in the area where you can take a little bit of magic dust and sprinkle it all over, wake up tomorrow morning, it's 10 times better than it is today. Where would you choose to put that magic dust? 
Oh, that is a tough question. That's a, I have to make a quick decision. I, I would put the magic dust on the product, on, on advancing the product. Beautiful. For those that want to keep up with all the amazing work that y'all are doing, to see the progress over the next three to five years that want to connect with you even, uh, where can we advise them go to go for more information? Um, our LinkedIn page was where you'll probably see the most updates, you know, um, and we are actually on LinkedIn. Our handle is at the here team. That's on all of our socials. I, and then just our general website, you know, we'll always, and that is, you know, we are here.com. Beautiful. I'll make sure to put all of that in the video description below. So as soon as we wrap up, make sure you go down and click the links, go check it all out. Um, Carolyn, I'll probably put your LinkedIn in there as well. So send a, send her a message, say, Hey, saw you on the business spotlight. Great conversation. Excited to see things, you know, that sort of thing, but make sure you connect. It's always fun to, to see with these spotlight conversations to actually connect. So, um, Carolyn, as we finish off, I always like to end on, on one very specific question. And that is simply what is most inspiring to you today? My co-founder every single day. So my co-founder Shay, well, I have more than one, but Shay, um, is a two-time cancer survivor. She's younger than I am. Uh, and she took that. She used to be deputy director of Eisenhower fellowships, but she went back to school. She became an integrative health coach, trauma resiliency certified. And she spends every day lifting up and helping people who are panicked because they can't afford their rent. They can't afford their treatment. They don't know what to do about preserving their fertility. I mean, every day she deals with high stress situations and she does it with grace and dignity and these individuals feel so heard and then i just get to enjoy all the wonderful glowing recommendations people give because you know we are here to help them you know do what they needed to do but that is so really driven by shay that she has literally become my daily inspiration that is beautiful i love that um, well, Carolyn, I want to say thank you again for taking the time to, to be here to share a bit of the story, but of the amazing work that y'all are, are currently doing and the, the problems in the world that you are looking to solve. And it's, it's truly inspiring to me. And I want to just say thank you for taking the time to, to be here today. Um, and, uh, yeah, just simply, I appreciate it. And thank you. Thank you so much.